Elliot Moore, and I am a third year DMA uh, orchestral conductor, and this is one of my favorite pieces. So I asked if it would be okay if I did the entire pre concert lecture, and boy, what a turnout. It looks like we have some fans of B minor max. So, uh, I wonder, that, uh, let's hope, let's hope, let's hope I pass. This is actually part of my uh, requirements in order to pass. <laughs> so please laugh at my jokes. And, uh, <coughs> you need, let's go to the next slide. So I wanted to talk about the history of the B minor mass and, and uh, sort of how it was composed, the order in which it was composed, because it was composed in a very strange order. We started with the song tunes. Now, I have this chart, which is extremely important. And it's also extremely important for me to let you guys know that we begin at the bottom. This is the first movement. You can't even see it. It's okay. Now, the song tooth is up here. That was written first. In 1724, um, on Christmas Day was the first performance. After that, Bach began at the beginning. So he started down here, and he wrote all the way up until here. Okay? That's the Misa. It's the sections, the uh, Kyrie and the Gloria. Now, he wrote those for a job application, which he got, and he moved to Dresden. So, let's go to the next slide. Then, he took a 15-year break, and he didn't write any of the maps. When he started again, he started the Credo section, and then he went and finished. So it took him 15 years to begin. And during those 15 years, he studied, he studied quite a lot of bit of 16th century counterpoint. And I'll discuss some of the counterpoint later in that, uh, in, in this lecture. So it took 24 years for him to complete the entire mass. Now, how many of you are familiar with Handel's Messiah? Good. You know how long it took Handel to write that? Six months. 24 days. It took Bach 24 years to write this. It's a big difference. Now, one of the other things that's also a very big difference with this piece as opposed to, say, Handel's Messiah, is that it's tough to tell, but roughly 40% of this piece is parody. Now, if you don't know what a parody is in music, it's when you have, um, you have a movement that's been composed with a specific text setting. So it has words to it, right? And then the composer, he takes the same music and he puts different words to it. Now, there are two movements in here which are parody. The Gracias and the Dona Nobis Pacho. They're in blue. So I'll give you an example of this. place together. So, 40% that's not <laughs> So 40% of the B minor mass was taken from other compositions that he had written earlier, right? But it still took him uh, 24 years to do this. Now, let's keep going. Uh, was the B minor mass conceived as separate music or just thrown together? Was it conceived as a whole? I think we can actually keep going because, no, I'd like to say one other thing. The first clue that we get into Bach's intention about if this is a whole piece or just a bunch of movements thrown together happens in 18, sorry, 1748, two years before his death. He decides to completely rewrite in a beautiful penmanship the entire mass. And um, so this is the first time that you get an impression that he saw it as one whole and not just a bunch of different things that he kind of compiled. So, next slide. Uh, this is important because um, for the first time,
time we see clearly, Bach's intention was to have this unified, this work unified, right? We just said that. Performance history. Um, so the first time that any of the mass was performed was not during Bach's life. He never heard any of this stuff with the title of Mass. The first time it was performed was by his son, Carl Philip Emanuel Bach. He did only the credo section, so the, these, which are colored, and I'll explain the colors in a little bit, a little bit later. And the first time, sorry, so CPE Bach did that after his father's death for a fundraising concert. And then, the first complete performance of the Mass was in, 18, was in the 1850s, that's what scholars believe. So in the 1850s, just to give you guys a little bit of context, Wagner had just begun composing the Ring Cycle. That was the first complete performance of the B minor Mass, which we're about to hear tonight. So, there's a, we're, we're moving on to what I think the B minor Mass means. And there's a noted Bach scholar, Timothy Smith, who draws a parallel to the importance of the B minor Mass and its role in Western music, and he compares that with Michelangelo's creation of pattern in Western art. He writes, Michelangelo's creation was, uh, as an icon, would have a seek God. His eyes intensely focused upon Adam, full of energy, reaching out to his creation, active, involved, interested. While Adam, in a daze, with his back towards God, reaches out with limp wrists and a half-turned head, barely aware of what is happening. Now, don't go quite yet, because while well, that's the iconic uh, version of what this painting is, please, there are more modern influences. It says, pull my finger. <laughs> so the question is, is the B minor mass, is it just pretty music? Is that all that we're hearing? Do we, or, or is there something else? Is there a representation of God? So my goal in making this presentation is for you not to listen to tonight's performance as a bunch of pretty music, but rather as Bach's representation of God. So let's talk about the structure. I've discussed that this diagram begins at the bottom, but not at the top. Now, we're going to start looking at the credo section, which is the colored section. Now, you'll notice that the orange sections here, 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 this could also be orange, by the way. Those are choral movements. The yellow, those are solo movements. Now, do you guys see any sort of pattern that happens? I know you can't see exactly right here, but we have two, we have two, we have one, we have one, and we have those two. Anyone? It's a palindrome, right? It's a palindrome. You have two, two, solos, and then you have the three inner movements. Now, right at the very middle is the crucifixus, okay? Crucifixion happens right in the middle. Now, as I was talking about earlier, we have these blue movements, right? So, let's talk about those. Um, those are kind of counterbalances. So, if you can, I'll put this down. Let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten movements. Then we have the crucifixion. Right? If you start at the top, it's also one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten movements. There are ten movements on either side, which makes it that the crucifixus is absolutely in the middle of the piece. Now, um, so, and as I discussed, there is a question of a counterbalance, and I hope that this holds because I spent a lot of time. Folks, I am not an engineer here. <laughs> this is the form of the piece. It's a cross, right? That's how Bach designed this entire B minor mass, is that at the crucifixion, it makes a cross, and these movements serve as counterbalancing. So, let's see if I can go back. <sighs> Yes, it was. <laughs>
constructions that are repeated or reversed are either in repeated or reversed order. Now, Bach does exactly that to dramatize the centrality of the cross, so that he's, he's making this as a cross. Now, let's talk about the actual movement the crucifix was, because that's obviously where, where the, the drama is going. So it's a Pasacalia, right? Pasacalias have long been associated with lamentations. There's Dido's Lament, which is a Pasacalia from Dido and Aeneas. Very famous Pasacalia. So because it's with lamentations, suffering and death also kind of go with that. So um, it ends with the Picardy Third. Now, a Picardy Third, I think a lot of you are musicians, so you probably know. But for those of you who don't know, the Picardy Third is when you have minor music it turns then to major right at the end. So, um, it generally kind of has a feeling of hope or redemption, which is, I think, what Bach is doing, but I think that Bach's idea is that through Christ's death, we may live. That's, I think, the, the image. He does something else really amazing, that before I show you, we need to do a review of German. So, <coughs> B, in German is B. B means B flat. Okay? A is A natural, that shouldn't be surprising. C is C natural, but then there's H. H is B natural. And you notice that spells Bach, right? So Bach, all of Bach's, the letters in his name, they all make notes. So, next slide. So Bach starts doing some really interesting things. He, well, let's see, I guess I can say here. Here is the B natural, H, then C, then B flat, then A. Now, right at the very end, he puts in B, A, C, H, right? But he spells his name into the crucifixion. And because H is B natural, and we are in the key of G, then that becomes, the H becomes the hope. It becomes the Picardy 30, which is really, really cool. <laughs> Let's go on. Numerology. So if A is 1, let's see, oh, I put it in. I made some people guess what H was the other day. So if A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, H, okay, 8, we can all count. So 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 8 is 14. That's Bach's magic number. He loves 14. Now, I'm going to play you the Credo movement. And I'm going to do my best to count because there are a lot of entrances. We're going to see how many entrances there are. Okay, everybody, um, we are going to open now. And here we go. Three, One, two, three, 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 four, three, four, two second entrance. There's numerology, there's further numerology that goes along with that. 
So if we begin the next movement, let's see what happens. I don't know if you got it, but it's really confusing to understand what they're saying because they have two things being said at the same time. They're saying credo in unum deo and patremonipotent at the same time. Now, why would you do that? Well, in this movement, which is so cool, it's the only movement where Bach wrote the number of bars at the end of the movement. There are 84 bars. Now, let me find my place really quickly, really quickly. So, he gives us the 14th one at the beginning of the Patron, right? But, what he says is that, um, <laughs> so he felt close to God for many reasons. One is that they're both creators. The, uh, the word for, uh, let's see, factorum means creator. But it also has a cognate which is priest, sorry, artist or poet. So Bach is an artist, and he feels as though he's a poet, also a creator. Both he and God are creating things from nothing. God designed the world and gave order to that which is chaotic and formless, and that's sort of what Bach does as well. He deals with vibrations, and he gives forms, such as crosses that don't stand up very well, to, uh, to, to form music. Now, how many days did it take God to create the heavens and the earth? Six. It took six days, not seven days. He rested on the seventh day. Now, box number is 14, right? So, 6, the number of days of creation, and Bach, who is creating, 6 times 14, 84, total number of bars. That's why he wrote the number 84 at the end of the movement. So, let's go to uh, Confiteor. There are three parts in this uh, in this movement. It has, let's see, actually we're going to listen to this. Let's see if I can get it up quickly. I can. Oh, there we go. There it is. So, there are five parts. There's a, sorry, three parts. The first one is a confession of baptism. It's a five-part fuel exposition. The second part is the remission of sins, which is also a five-part exposition sorry, five-part fugal exposition, which is making a double fugue. Now, that's pretty impressive. As if that weren't enough, he decides to add a Gregorian chant in the tenor voice, and not only does he do that, adding to the double fugue, after that, he then puts the Gregorian chant in augmentation with the double fugue. So, one of the things that I have felt about this for quite a long time was that the the number three, of course, is always important in religious music because it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Trinity. And I think that this is Bach's way of introducing the idea of the Holy Trinity into the act of baptism. So let's have a quick listen to that. Second view. 
Now let's go on to the next one. Oh, don't we need it? Perfect. So there are two sets of texts really in this. Lord God, Heavenly King, God of the Father, Father Almighty. And then the second one is, O oh Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, Most High, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father. Now, most composers set these two ideas separately. There's God, and then there's Jesus. That's not what Bach does, and I can't play it for you because it's so soft that I don't think that we, we would hear it. So, I have the following note in my score. It says, most composers separate these two ideas into two movements, but not Bach. The Council of Trent frowned on this, and it was banned later by a palpable decree. Mixing text made it impossible to understand. However, Bach wanted to show and teach that Jesus' words, John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. So he combines two sets of texts at the exact same time, and you can't really understand what they're saying, but the concept is that you can have both people in the same. So I wanted to just point that out. The next one is just some text painting. It's, um, we expect the resurrection. Now when it comes to resurrection, what happens is the music ascends. So here is that. this entire piece, all sorts of text people. So, there's a really great thing, and I'm very glad that I found this. It's symbolism. Um, wait, let's see, I have it under the symbolism, but it's a very tricky <laughs> spot, especially for sopranos. So, um, it's the only time there's a bridge that goes between the confiteor and et expecto, I expect the resurrection. It's one of the most personal moments in the Mass. It's the only moment in the Mass when there are, when there's just one voice. There's no accompaniment, there's no counterpoint, just the soprano singing alone. It only lasts for a bar and a half, but nevertheless, that's a big bar and a half in this, in this piece. So, if, let's see, I'll just say this. This bar was so difficult for Bach that he crossed it out. And he crossed it out and he tried writing over it and he couldn't quite find the right spell of all the notes to, to signify going from the flat keys to going to the sharp keys, and the sharp keys is where um, the resurrection happens. So let's take a look at Bach's original manuscript. So right here, I don't know if you guys can read that, but, no, but nobody can. <laughs> so, so good luck with that. Now, so fortunately, um, Carl Philip Emanuel, Bach, Bach's son, he had this score, and he was able to figure out a different spelling for all these things. So this, what are in the parts and what are in the scores today are from Carl Philip, Philip Emanuel and when he redid this. So, summary. Oh, good. We have two minutes. Um, so Robert Frost said, every time a poem is written, it is not written by cunning, but by belief, but by belief. So the question is, does Bach's B minor mass contain cunning? It certainly does. There's a five-part double fugue with a chant and augmentation that we listen to. It includes his signature, right, B-A-C-H, spelled in at various moments, and it uses numerology to draw links between creative people. So yes, there is cunning here. But it wasn't written for the cunning. It was written for his belief. Bach's belief at the end of his life when he was totally blind, was that by listening closely to this piece, we might hear the voice of God saying, Fear not, for I am with you always. So thank you very much, and I wanted to... <laughs> we have about a minute left. Are there any questions? Is this um, version of the instruction the same as the AC? Well, it is, but there's been a lot of scholarly work which has been done of late because most people when they think of the B minor mass, they consider you know, this huge chorus. And in fact, Bach didn't have a huge chorus. He only had basically boys, boys and men, and they were sick a lot, and 
he, um, he wasn't able to actually have more than one person on a part. So in box day, something like this probably would have been performed with just one person on a part. But people thought, well, Handel, Handel had a lot of you know, singers. He had huge forces, and he loved huge forces, so why not do it like, like Handel would have done? So in the 1850s, it was being done very often with huge, like 200-member choruses. And the first time it was done in the United States was in 1900, with, I want to say, 197-member chorus, so very large. Are there any other quick questions? Yes. Well, um, Latin Yes, that's an excellent point. And one of the reasons that it's, and this is a big question, why did Bach, who is a real Lutheran, why did he write something in Latin? And it seems as though, and what I've read about this, is that when he was applying for this job, where he wrote the, the first part, the Elector of Saxon had recently converted to Catholicism, so he thought, I need to write something in Latin so that I get the job. So that seemed to be one of the one of the motivators. Are there any other questions? Can you get this put on TED so I can watch it? <laughs> I hope that got on my video so that my, my uh, committee passes me. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much, and please do it.